Coming up on Rob on the Road, we're celebrating the best of 10 seasons, a decade of destinations. It's hard to believe it's been 10 years covering America's greatest playground, the Golden State, California. By planes, trains, and automobiles, boats, zip lines, and even taking flight. We're glad you're on board as Rob on the Road starts now. And now, Rob on the Road, exploring Northern California. Hi there, I'm Rob Stewart, and we are celebrating the best of 10 seasons, a decade of destinations on Rob on the Road. We have traveled together to hundreds of locations, majestic mountains, the stunning California coastline, and our bountiful valley. We've met people who left handprints on our hearts and seen sights that still shine in our souls. Look at this beautiful setting that we've brought you to today in the middle of the Sutter Buttes with one of the guide hikers here and just an expert of the Sutter Buttes, Laura Lush. Good to see you. Nice to have you out here in our favorite place. Oh, I see why it's your favorite place. Thank you for bringing us in here. Well, we're thrilled to be able to share the Buttes with you guys today. I'm so glad. So what are we going to see? Oh, we're going to see the buttes. You're going to see some neat rocks. You're going to go for a hike and see some plants. And we're going to get way up in the middle of the buttes. Middle Mountain Interpretive Hikes handles all of the hikes here because this yes. is not open for people just to come in. Correct. This is private property. In fact, we're accessing a property that's four miles off the county road. So we're excited to bring you in where most people can't go. All right. I like that. Ready to go. Thank you. All right. Let's take off. All right. Next step. We've just come through the gate at the Dean Place and everywhere you look is picture perfect. I can't get over this, Laura. We never do. <laughs> you never do. We never. On these hikes that people can sign up and, and take, they take you away from everything on the everyday norm and they immerse you in nature. And I like to say that they're out of place and out of time. Mm. You're away from your normal life, you kind of disconnect, you've stepped back 150 years, and yes, you're surrounded by nature. I wanted to stop here and talk geology, because you see it. Yes. The origins of the Buttes. The Buttes are an extinct volcano. They're a volcano in the middle of the Central Valley, and that in and of itself makes them incredibly unique. When you drive up and down the Sacramento Valley, you see this lump, and it's an old volcano. And so you come up here and you see this, and this is called an andesite dome. The most common volcanic rock on the planet is andesite, like Andes Mountains, mm -hmm. and this is andesite. And to give you a little perspective on the type of volcano that the Buttes were, because they are extinct, it's like Mount St. Helens. It's a plug dome volcano where it was never spewing molten lava. It was blasts of rock and hot gas. Mm. Think Pompeian Vesuvius, which was a plug dome volcano. Think um, flowing mud and rocks, those are called lahars. And that's how the buttes were formed. These pushed up and exploded preformed rock and gas and ash. And if it was wet and muddy when it blew, um, then the rocks floated along on the mud to form some of the hillsides that we've seen. And this goes back more than a million years. Yes into the Pleistocene era about a million point four to a million point two years ago. Fascinating. Oh, and but that's in geological time, these are babies. That's why they're so rugged, because they are rugged when you start walking out here and you see all the rocks on the surface. When you drive through California, Northern California, and you see the Sutter Buttes, they are very pretty. But when you get up close, they're spectacular. And they're totally different. And you look up at the columns of rocks up at the very top with the vultures circling over them, mm. and you see the plants below, and you really don't realize you're in the middle of rice fields and prune orchards. All 
All right, we almost made it. Worth every step, huh? Yes, always. Oh my gosh. Told you. When you stand here and this is your view, what goes on in, in your brain? From this particular view where I don't see much humanity involved here, I like to think, what did this look like 250 years ago? Maybe this. Yeah. And I hope it stays that way. I think that's all of our sincere hope is that it stays this way. Thank you, Laura. Absolutely, thank you. What a pleasure. We truly appreciate you coming out here and helping us share the word about the Buttes. Welcome to the Point San Pablo Yacht Harbor. This place is absolutely beautiful. Just take a look. We're gonna take you out into the San Pablo Bay and we're gonna go on a trip to the East Brother Light Station. And Richard Forger is one of the innkeepers over at the East Brother Light Station. Good to see you. Hi, Rob. How are you? Thanks Thank for coming you. out. Absolutely glad to be here. Thank you for having me on board. Sure. We're going on quite a journey today. We are. It's going to be exciting. It is absolutely beautiful. The mm -hmm. East Brother Light Station. Mm -hmm. You and your wife are the two innkeepers. That's correct. We're on the boat called the Lucretia. We'll tell you why it's named Lucretia coming up. It's actually got a special story. About a 10 minute ride out there? 10 minutes, that's all it is. And the water's gonna be nice and smooth today. And this is how the guests get out there too. Exactly. So we've made it out to the light station, Richard, and this is how everyone goes up, huh? This is it, right up here. There's about, uh, right now at the low tide, there's about, oh, 10, 12 steps. Tomorrow morning, at high tide, it'll only be about five or six steps. Okay, and I do want to point out, though, that if someone is handicapped, you can take them up in the boat. That's correct. Okay, mm -hmm. I'm gonna go on up, we'll see you at the top. You got it. Okay. Oh my gosh, look at that. This has been here since 1873. My goodness, and how I, gorgeous. Back in the uh, 1980s, they were, it was in pretty bad shape. The East Brother Light Station Foundation was created and they restored it back to its original state as close as possible to when it was originally built. This is spectacular. I know about three decades ago, it opened up as a bed and breakfast. Right. And I can't believe you actually get to spend the night here in the middle of the bay. Oh yeah. Absolutely beautiful. I mean, you're just surrounded by beauty. Yeah, it's its own little ecosystem out here. It's very remote, yet very close. Very good way to put it. This is East Brother, and that's West Brother. On West Brother is a wildlife habitat all of its own. Yeah, just teeming with life out there. You've got harbor seals, you've got cormorants, you've got pelicans. Look at the little seals yeah. sleeping. Now, this must be a lower tide because I see the right. watermark. Right, yeah, this is lower tide, and that's the only time they, they hop up on the rocks like that. But at high tide, you'll find that they, they've all gone. And it's starting to drizzle here a little bit. I mean, we really are out in the middle of Mother Nature and the climate is constantly changing. Right, always changing. This was built in 1873, but the plan started way before that. Back in the 1850s, when California just became a state, well, uh, the, you know, you had the gold rush going on then. And so there was all kinds of maritime traffic going up and down this waterway just to get up to the gold country. So they needed some kind of marker here. Now this uh, acts as a boundary line between San Pablo Bay and, uh, and San Francisco Bay. And the mariners at the time needed some kind of marker because San Pablo Bay is so shallow and a lot of uh, boats would, would ground. So the United States government appropriated funds to develop uh, lighthouses all up and down the West Coast. And the very first lighthouse that was built was what Alcatraz. do you think? Alcatraz, yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. And then they started building lighthouses up and down the coast. 
finally in the late 1850s, they thought, well, let's build some more lighthouses inside the bay. However, in the early 1860s, what happened in U.S. history? The Civil War. The Civil War, and that froze funds for quite a while. So, finally the Civil War is over, what, seven or eight years later, and uh, in the early 1860s, early 1870s, one contractor got the job to build five lighthouses mm. inside the bay, of which this is one of them. I find it fascinating that someone can come out here and stay inside such a historic gem mm -hmm. that is actually a still working lighthouse, right. still part of the entire Coast Guard, and, I mean, the beauty. Oh, it's, it's, it's gorgeous out here, it really is. What a beautiful Victorian house. Working our way to the top. The stairs are just beautiful. Okay, and this is, oh wow, this is it. This is the light up here, the LED light that was installed about two years ago. Zero moving parts, uh, light bulbs that uh, last between 50 and 100,000 hours. It's just a 360 view that you really only can get from a lighthouse just like this. Right. This really is one of the showstoppers as to why you come out here. You get to come up to the top and walk outside and, and it's open for people. Well, what's really spectacular is coming out here at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, too, and it's crystal clear, and you can see not only the city of San Francisco, but you can see the Bay Bridge and the art light show that's on the bridge as well. Wow, fantastic. So. Now, we mentioned on the boat ride out here that the boat is named Lucretia. Right. And that started an era in the 1960s of restoration. Tell me the story of the two. That's right. Well, at the time in the 1960s, the Coast Guard was running this lighthouse. And at one time, they had people out here manning it. However, as automation made the island more sophisticated, the need for anybody to be out here became unnecessary. So uh, they left the island completely, and they would just periodically show up to check on the light and the foghorn, which they still do. About every two to three months, they show up to check on them. However, at the time, uh, they felt that they didn't just didn't have the budget to take care of this building. So the Coast Guard proposed tearing all the buildings down. My goodness. Tearing it all down and then replacing this lighthouse with a steel tower and oh. installing the light on top of it. That would have been a travesty. Well, there's this woman called Lucretia Edwards, and she got a little incensed because uh, the Coast Guard was messing with her Victorian house with a picket fence. Good for her, by the and, way. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so she got together with the Contra Costa Parks Association, and they got the paperwork together and had the island designated a historical landmark. Wow. And that's what saved the, all these buildings from being torn down and thus the very fitting boat name, Lucretia. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. We decided to honor her by naming the boat, Luc uh, the boat Lucretia. She lives on by bringing all the tourists out right. here that That's saved right. her Victorian That's house. That's right. I find it fascinating to meet people on the road and to find places like this that are actually people's offices. Yes. <laughs> Their homes. Right. And for you, your office and your home is right in the middle of the San Francisco Bay. That's right. Not a bad job. No, not a bad job at all. You know, we have, we have barely have, have internet connectivity out here so that we can do our bookings. We don't have television. We don't have anything. In fact, one of the things that some of the guests ask, where are the televisions? Who needs one? You know, you don't come out here to watch television. You come out here to mellow out. And disconnect. That's right. And still ahead on Rob on the Road, a decade of destinations. Inside and on top of one of San Francisco's most iconic towers. But first, an island getaway for a breathtaking behind the scenes tour. So we are 
in for a treat today. We are in downtown Avalon on Catalina Island with Ron Lauder. Good to see you, Ron. Good to see you. Been a tour guide for 30 years here. So I guess you know your stuff. I know my, most of my way around. I, I don't get lost very often. Now, there's a famous loop that a lot of people take on golf carts. Right. Mm -hmm. This road is one of the longest coastal roads on the entire island. It's a whole mile and a half. This island's so mountainous, we don't have a lot of coastal roads out here. The main mode of transportation on the island is a golf is cart. A golf cart. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> That's living. That is unreal. That right there says it all. Oh, I always think it's beautiful out here. You can see about four miles down to that last point down there. That's called Long Point. That's where the island's at its widest. It's about eight miles across our island from there. And the length of our island from the east end to the west end is around 21 miles long. So got a total of 76 square miles of island out here. And here to the left, we'll see what's called the Inn on Mount Ada. This was originally built back in 1921 as the home of Mr. and Mrs. William Wrigley Jr. They were, of course, the chewing gum Wrigleys. And when they built the house out here, Mr. and Mrs. Wrigley would spend a lot of time enjoying their summers here on the island. Now, I don't know if you know this or not, but the Chicago Cubs trained here on the island for over 30 years. That's fascinating. That was a ball team, of course, owned by the Wrigleys. That was one of the ways that Wrigley wanted to attract visitors here to the island in the springtime. And once William Wrigley Jr. arrived here for the first time and saw the island, went out in the hills and explored the interior of the island, he fell in love with it. And all of his partners really wanted to develop the island. But Wrigley had the foresight to see that this, this island was very beautiful and very natural, and that should be preserved. Because back in 1919, he could see that Southern California was growing rapidly. Originally, all of Avalon was considered to be the world's largest one-floor hotel, and it was all tents. Well, eventually, over the years, those tents were replaced with these little cottages we see here today. Mrs. Wrigley really enjoyed uh, succulent plants. Here in Avalon, in order to enhance the, uh, the beauty of the town, she planted her garden up in here, and she collected succulents from all over the world. So beautiful. And look at the sun just cresting over the beautiful Wrigley Memorial. We just crossed over the opposite side of Avalon here. So we just weaved our way around the loop and we're coming back down into Avalon. Coming back down into Avalon again. That is just spectacular. So that is so Mediterranean looking to me. Yeah, we have a Mediterranean style um, environment here on the island. In fact, our climate is basically the same as the Mediterranean. You can travel all over the world and still not find a place like this. Uh, this place really is oh. magical. There's uh, you know, beautiful sights to see. The water is awesome. The people have been friendly. Um, everything's just been a wonderful experience here. It's just calm. I mean, living in LA, it's so busy. And just to escape here for a little bit, and it's like time just kind of slows down. The Catalina Island Conservancy was deeded over 42,000 acres of land from the Wrigley family in 1972, and now manages about 90% of the island, including 62 miles of shoreline. We met up with Matt McLean of the Catalina Conservancy. Well, this is Stage Road. This is the uh, primary road from the town of Avalon out into the interior. This is like the Galapagos of California. <laughs> it is. Actually, Catalina, you know, you'd think that uh, there wouldn't be a lot of uh, endemic wildlife, but we have over 61 endemic species that are found nowhere else in the world. So it's really important to kind of protect this land. And so that's why the Catalina Island Conservancy was created. There's just not a lot of land like this anymore. You know, here in California, certainly, but even across the world,
I spotted the bison. Yep, there's a herd of bison. So our, our bison are kind of iconic here for Catalina. Um, they were first brought over in 1924 by a film crew who were actually coming out to do a movie. Um, unfortunately, they never ended up in the movie. And so when the uh, film crew left, they left the bison out here. Well, here we are on the opposite side of the island, and uh, oh. just, it's amazing. You know, just the, it, it seems like the whole vibe changes when you come over here. This is probably one of the most iconic uh, scenes and panorama that's on the island. Tourists come from all over the world to see what we just saw. Probably one of the best things about my job is I get to kind of share that secret with everybody else. And so hopefully you know, we want people to come over and experience some of that same magic. The magic of Catalina Island. Yep. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. What a pleasure. Yeah, we're psyched to have you. Well, look where we are, somewhere I've been dying to come to, Coit Tower for an amazing behind the scenes tour with the master tour guide here, Davey Crockett. Good to see you, Davey. Good to see you. I'm glad you guys were able to come today. Thank you so much. It's so nice to be here. You've got a lot to show us here at Coit Tower, which went through major renovations now it is shining in its glory like it was meant to in the very beginning. So can we go inside for a tour? Come on in. Okay, thank you. My goodness. About 2,000 people a day come in here during the summertime. And what we're trying to do is do a paradigm shift in terms of having people care about the art rather than just taking the elevator ride to the top. The murals are spectacular. It blows my mind, the vibrancy of the colors here. Well, it's the nature of fresco. It's earth pigments that have been ground very fine, mixed with distilled water. At 80 years old, this fresco still isn't cured. So technically, this is still a drying painting. I am so excited about what's next because behind a closed door and up the stairs, you have a behind the scenes tour for us. Yes, we do. Of some spectacular art. Let's go take a look. Let's go take a okay. look. Davey, why are the murals in the hallways blocked off from the public? Well, there's no protection up here. So we bring people up here with no more than eight at a time under docent supervision. And you know, I'm sure that you can hear the echoey sound. It's because we literally are in the walkways all the way up to the top of White Tower. Here you see a lot of sports and athletics and Outdoor life in California. Outdoor life in California. That's exactly what this is. Who is the artist here? This particular artist was Edward Kurata. He was a native Japanese, very famous art professor in Japan. Over here, this is called the playground. Ralph Chessy was the only African-American painter in here from New Orleans. That makes me think of something. This painting being by the only African-American painter then in here. This painting right here, this mural by the only Asian painter at that time in the mural project here. And that leads me to the point that these murals were also about social justice. Absolutely. The interaction among the artists, the fact that they were men painting, women painting, Asians, African Americans, all on the same bar. Isn't that fantastic? And I love that it was ahead of its time. Very much so. 
This room is different than all the rest. Absolutely, different material, different technique, different color palette. This is Jane Berlandina, who painted on dry plaster using egg yolk tempera. Well, we've made it to the top of Coit Tower. Look at this view. You see Treasure Island, you see the piers, and you see the San Francisco Bay Bridge. This is the outdoor deck, which is closed to the public. The Belvedere level, correct. The Belvedere level, and tourists go about 20 more steps higher, and they're behind windows. But right now, we have the perfect opportunity to do a 360 tour of the city. So can we do it really quickly? Absolutely, okay. come on ahead. Let's go. So. Look at this part of town. Transamerica Pyramid, Telegraph Hill. Let's keep walking. Look at this. Washington, Washington Square in the heart of Little Italy. At St. Peter and Paul's Church with the Swires. Look at the Golden Gate Bridge. And up there you'll see the curvy part of Lombard Street with all the cars creeping slowly oh, down. Oh yeah. Oh my gosh. And there's Alcatraz. In all its splendor. And then we make our way back over here to where we started. Such a splendid view. I'm it, glad you guys were able to come and take a look at it. Literally leaves me speechless. <laughs> it is a special place. I had no idea the things I would see here and the sights I would see here as well. So thank you. You're very welcome. Here at Coit Tower on Telegraph Hill in San Francisco. Thank you for joining us on Rob on the Road, a decade of destinations as we celebrate the best of 10 seasons. Thank you so much for your support.